Well, welcome to those of you who are just logging on. And for those of you who've been with us for a couple of minutes, uh, I imagine that when you took that 30 seconds to just listen to what God might be saying, he actually said something to you. The question is, how do we follow through on that? And I think I'd like to take a few minutes just to talk about that today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, we will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Uh, Jesus was teaching God's word and the crowds were getting larger and the people were pressing in closer and Jesus needed a way to, to separate himself a little bit so more people could hear him. So he came up with this idea just to ask for one of the fishermen who had a boat there to paddle out a little bit and let him use the boat as a platform from which to speak. When Jesus was done with his teaching, he looked at the fishermen and he just asked to go out on a little fishing trip of his own. He says, let's go out to deep water and let's let down the nets. And Peter had some very good reasons not to go do that. Uh, first of all, he had already worked hard all night long. This is the time when after he finished cleaning his nets, he would get a little rest. Uh, secondly, fishing like this is not done in the daytime, it's done at night. And lastly, for Simon, this is, this is not a hobby. This is hard work. But Peter also had a reason to actually let down the nets, and that was because you say so. I'm guessing we've all done things that we would prefer not to do, and I'm interested in what some of those reasons why might be. There's lots of responsibilities we have in uh, adulting where we need to take care of things and follow through on things. And we don't necessarily want to do it, but we do it. And then there are times when God asks us to do something. When was the last time God asked you to do something you weren't all that interested in? And in that moment, in the following moments, how did you respond? How did you work through that? Because there will always be reasons to ignore God's direction in our life. We'll always have plenty of reasons to ignore his direction. So the question is not so much, how do I feel about God's directions, but what is God asking me to do? That's a great question. So I believe that God is more interested in working with us than in doing for us. Let me say that again. I believe God is more interested in working with us than in doing for us. Jesus could have commanded the fish just to jump into the boat. When you think about it, that would have been a very impressive miracle. Peter's just standing there and all of a sudden fish come from every side. But Jesus actually gave Peter an option to work with him. Jesus gave Peter an option to obey. Jesus has not come to impress us. Jesus has actually come to transform us. And that requires a different process. For example, uh, we've all probably had some moment in our life when we wanted to lose a couple of pounds. You don't lose weight by watching a video about losing weight. You lose weight by watching what you eat. 
or maybe you want to build some muscle. You don't build muscle by looking at weights. You build muscle by lifting weights. Well, we all need to be inspired. We all need to be instructed. But we also need to be transformed. And as it turns out, transfer transformation in our lives only occurs when we participate, when we engage in the process. So God may ask us to do something again rather than asking us to do something else. God may ask us to do something again rather than asking us to do something else. If something isn't working, a lot of times it makes sense just to do something different or maybe to quit doing it altogether. And God has lots of creative ideas. Uh, we can try something new or do something different. But some provision in our lives doesn't flow out of new things. It flows out of same things. Doing something again, that's a matter sometimes of faithfulness. Maybe you've tried to improve your marriage and you've gotten tired. But maybe there's something you need to keep doing. Or relationships with your parents or with your children or, or maybe an, a work opportunity or a promotion. Sometimes we just get tired. We get fatigued with our efforts and we get disappointed and that can drive us to distraction. But sometimes, rather than losing our resolve, we just need to try again and see what God does with it. Now, this is not an argument against God doing new things. I think God is very creative, and he often calls us to take new steps down a path. But there are also times when he calls us to obedience simply by asking us to do something that we have reasons not to do or not to do again. See, faith is not actually revealed in the thoughts that we think or the things that we're against. Faith is obedience to God. Let me say that again. Faith is obedience to God. I will do what you say because you asked me to. That's faith. If you can only respond to the level of your understanding, then your faith could be very limited in your life. So Peter had worked all night. He had diligently cared for and was cleaning his nets. These are the tools of his trade. He has to take very good care of them. And the idea that he would go out into deep waters and cast the nets again, this is going to cost him something. It's going to cost him some lost sleep. It's, it's going to cost him some energy. It's going to cost him having to clean those nets again. And we often think about what obedience is going to cost us. But what is the cost for not obeying? That's an interesting thing to think about, too. Not obeying costs us something. Sometimes it costs us provision or peace, or potential. We need to learn how to exercise faith by doing what Jesus says. So Peter couldn't see what Jesus saw, but he was willing to do what Jesus said. And as a result, there was a remarkable and miraculous provision that came into his life. He wasn't sure, but he was willing. And as it turns out, that's the process that God uses to build our faith. It isn't complicated. Peter was willing to act even though he wasn't certain of what the outcome would be. I think in our culture, there's a lot of connection between faith and certainty. There's an assumption that if you have faith, you're very sure, you're certain about some things. And the, the thing that I noticed is that the more certain people are in their spiritual thoughts, the more demeaning they can become in their language towards others who struggle with doubts. Uh, certainty can produce some pretty unkind and arrogant followers of Jesus. As odd as this sounds, and I know this sounds odd, but sometimes a little doubt can help someone become a better follower of Jesus. We should think about that a little bit. Uh, our lack of certainty could actually be an opportunity to learn something new. Peter may have hoped some things were true about Jesus. He may have been captivated by the words of Jesus. He may have even been impressed by the personality of Jesus. Those traits can make you a great fan, but Jesus wasn't calling Peter to be a fan. He was calling him to be a follower, and that's a very different thing. Well, he did. He let down the nets, and there was a miraculous catch of fish. And when this whole thing is over, 
He just falls at the knees of Jesus. And this is what he says. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. This is really interesting to me. I think most of us assume that if we get close to God, that it will be a very warm and enjoyable and comfortable experience for us. But actually, that's not how it usually works for most people. In God's presence, we begin to notice how unlike God we really are. Our strength is nothing compared to his strength. Our knowledge is nothing compared to his knowledge. Our ability is nothing compared to his ability. Our wisdom, it doesn't even come close to his wisdom. That comparison, we don't look so good. And the closer we get to God, the harder it is to ignore our own faults and our own failures. And so a lot of times when we begin to get close to God, we begin to sound like Peter. We want to create distance. But Jesus identified what the primary issue was. And the primary issue was Peter's fear. And the way Jesus addressed that is really fascinating. It's an interesting thing. He doesn't just say, don't be afraid. What he tells them is, is I'm giving you an assignment. From now on, you're going to fish for people. That, that somehow that called Peter out of his fear and towards his faith. Now, this is a story of how Peter begins to be a follower of Jesus, but there's another story, and it involves a miraculous catch of fish, and it happened after the crucifixion and after the resurrection of Jesus. You can read about this story in John chapter 21. Peter was fishing with some of the other disciples, and he had fished all night, and he had caught nothing. This sounds like a problem for Peter. And early in the morning, there's a person on shore. They're quite a ways off the shore. There's a person on shore, and he yells out to them, how is the fishing going? And they haven't caught anything, so they just they yell back, we're not catching anything. They didn't realize that this person was Jesus yet. And this person yells out to them, why don't you throw the nets on the other side of the boat? There are some fish there. And so they do it. Once again, they'd fished all night. They'd caught nothing, but they decide just to throw their nets on the other side of the boat. And they caught so many fish, they couldn't get them in the boat. And one of the other disciples says to Peter, it's the Lord. And in that moment, Peter throws on his outer garment, and he dives into the sea. And he begins to swim and make his way towards Jesus. The first time, the first time Peter saw a miraculous catch, he wanted to run away from Jesus. This time, he dove into the water, and he begins to swim towards Jesus. And this was after Peter's greatest failure. He had just, a few days before, denied Jesus three times. He had seen Jesus on a cross, and he had watched Jesus suffer, and he watched Jesus die. And all he wants, all he wants is to be with him again. Jesus, once again, gives Peter his calling when he's on the shore and they're eating some fish. Jesus tells Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. God's provision doesn't come from just working hard. It doesn't come from just watching or just waiting. Miraculous provision comes when we're obedient. If we can only take direction when it is our preference and when we like the process, then maybe it's not obedience at all. Because you say so, I will do it. That's obedience. And not only does God provide for our daily needs, he can also provide insight into who he is and who we are and vision as to what he is doing and what he's calling us to do. The question I have for you is what might God be calling you to do today that you might not be that interested in taking the next step on? It would be worth figuring that out. I know these days a lot of us are feeling like the next steps are not obvious or clear. And it's hard to imagine some reason why we're all where we are. But we can lean into the love of God. And we can let him know, if you want me to walk through this valley, I will do that if you want me to. I know that there are trials, but if those trials bring me closer to you, then I'll walk through those trials. 
I know that there are things that I wouldn't choose. But you've shown me a love that is greater than anything I've ever known. And I don't want to run away anymore. I want to move in. I want to get close. God never said that life would be easy. He did say we'd never be alone. Because of the suffering that we've seen what he has gone through, we can trust him to lead us through any valley we have to go through. So I'd like to just take a, a moment and pray with you. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, <laughs> sometimes faith doesn't feel like confidence and it doesn't feel like certainty. Sometimes it feels a little bit anxious. Sometimes we have more clarity on what we're supposed to do than confidence as to how that will work out. Will you help us today to learn to take steps of obedience, not because they're easy, not because they make sense, not because we fully support or in agreement, but just because you say so. We ask that you would use those moments of obedience to bring incredible provision of daily needs, of insight and of vision into our own life. Remind us of who you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is an opportunity when we get to practice generosity. Jesus actually tells us to give and it will be given. Often we don't realize the first part is a command. And out of that obedience, something flows. As it turns out, God has a vested interest in making sure that people who share have more than enough. See, the tendency is to spend everything or save everything but God wants to resource people who will share anything. And so that's why we have an opportunity to obey the options that God presents to us to be generous and to watch what he can do with it. So Father, I ask that you would help us today as we open our hearts and we open our hands, not only to release what you want to send through us, but to receive what you want to give to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, throughout this week, which represents the last week of Jesus' life, there were actually some really important moments that occurred. And so we thought it would be really interesting to create some holy moments this week to kind of follow that path along with Jesus. And so we're actually inviting you to go on a journey with us uh, this week and engaging in some holy moments. And uh, you can check out uh, our feed on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, also, there's a way to uh, prepare your heart for Resurrection Sunday. You can text 8890190 with the word moment, and that'll help you to be able to receive some daily prompts for these holy moments throughout this week. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm really looking forward to the time when we can all gather together again, but I'm so grateful we had this opportunity. I hope you have a great day and a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.